This is the first episode of the New Intelligence Podcast at 25th Century Magazine. Uh, It is wonderful that everyone could be here, and I'm hoping that uh, we can have many, many more episodes of this so that we can look back at this wonderful show and panel that we have today uh, a long time from now with mild embarrassment that everything came together in such a bare-bones way compared to what's going to happen in the future. So let's all look forward to that. Um, thank every, thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, I want to introduce everyone first of all. Um, sitting down over there is Robert Danish. Uh, Robert's a professor of communication at the University of Waterloo, and his work explores a lot about how communication relates to democracy, how communication practices can harm and improve democratic decision-making, and other aspects of uh, freedom in general in our society. Uh, Sitting right here is Robert Wan of um, Preemptor AI, and Robert is a data scientist turned CEO uh, who's worked at multiple companies in data and data science before beginning to transition into leadership after meeting Midras and Maya, our man over here. And Robert, Robert Wan's stance on AI is that this can be a decade-defining trend, maybe even beyond that. Good Lord, if it's beyond that. And, everyone, and that everyone should at least know how what is probably going to be the fourth industrial revolution, once again, is going to proceed uh, going forward and affect our future. And finally, at the end of the table over here is Midrasin Maya, who is the um, who's a PhD in communication, uh, researcher and professor here at Humber College. Um, Midrasin's currently working on a research project about rhetoric and artificial intelligence, uh, thinking about how big tech companies today manipulate and use our data Uh, in ways that sometimes can help build our desires and sometimes interfere with our desires, and then driving our behavior through all the power that AI analytics and interaction offer us. Uh, You might be wondering who I am. I'm the host, Adam Riggio, uh, content manager of 25th Century Magazine, and really looking forward to, once again, seeing how this podcast goes on today and develops into the future for quite some time. So... Um, The first thing I want to ask everyone uh, to begin with is let's talk about the general business applications, the most common business applications you might see AI working in, because that is, is the starting point of any of our analysis. The business applications are how we're going to interact with AI technology in in real life. And I'd want to start a little bit with... um, Robert Mon to uh, get us started. What are some of these applications and maybe what are the signs and potential that AI has to improve our lives uh, as it's being applied in the business world right now? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, thank you very much for starting off with uh, how can AI improve? Because it's a lot easier to think about ways any technology can harm society than improve, you know, society. Uh, the ways that any technology can harm society is almost straightforward. The harm always gets front-loaded, right? And the pain always gets front-loaded. And the benefits, you have to pay for them, and they eventually come in. It's like an investment. But uh, that investment is a very worthwhile one because AI is one of the first technologies in a very long time that can not just improve the efficiency of humans, which are the main... um, model, the main uh, unit of economic output in this economy, but also enhance their ability and in a way even replace them. And the reason why I, you know, call this the fourth industrial revolution is because in many ways it is that, right? The reason why the first industrial revolution was a revolution and not just, you know, some normal technology or some normal, you know, um, bump or blip in the uh, trend line is because the technologies that were invented in that revolution were able to not just help humanity, but also replace certain humans, right? Now, of course, in the short term, there is a lot of front-loaded pain, right? When people get replaced, when society gets presented with new technology, there's always a period of time where it needs to get used to it, right? Old economic models have to be upgraded, uh, outdated things have to be done away with, or... Um, manage the best they can. But uh, 
in the future, we will look back and think, how did human beings do jobs like that in the 21st century? Like you guys talk about the 25th century magazine, right? Mm-hmm. So in the 25th century, they'll look back and think, how did people do these things back then? You know, we look back and we think, how did a human being seriously sit in a field for 24 hours a day, manually, individually planting crops, right? We have tractors that do that nowadays. And a single farmer can do the work of a hundred farmers in, in the 19th and 18th century. That was really backbreaking work, you know? And in many ways, the potential of those people were wasted, right? Um, human beings are very, very smart people, very smart and very valuable units of uh, the economy. And it is a waste to use human beings on things like farming, right? Where, you know, human beings should be doing the big picture stuff. Today, farmers are more like meteorologists and biologists and scientists, right? They know exactly what type of pesticides and herbicides work together and what don't. They know what the weather's going to be like and everything. And a lot of the menial work that doesn't require a lot of, you know, brain power gets automated away. This is really what's going to happen with AI. A lot of the menial work of the 21st century, by the time the 25th century rolls around, is going to get automated away. And the people of the 25th century can focus on the big picture stuff that is actually interesting, produces the most economic impact, and that gets translated down to them, right? When you do work that is productive and makes a big impact, you get paid a big salary, right? So (laughs) in the short term, a lot of these, unfortunately, low salary jobs are going to get automated away. And they're going to be replaced in the future with high paying jobs and high impact jobs. That's going to cause a lot of pain in the short term. But that's really the benefit of AI, you know, a better world uh, with better living standards for everybody. Um, Now, one day we're going to get there. But you know, I'm not going to paint a rosy picture. It's going to take a lot of work. Yeah. And what might be in any, anyone else is welcome to, you know, contri- you know, throw into this as well. Um, what is that new world? What is that transition to that new world going to look like? I suppose I should say, where are, where are the pain points going to be? And, and what are the first benefits that we're really going to see when AI starts producing these benefits and these improvements to our society? Yeah, that's a really good question, actually. Um, I think it's very difficult to point to a certain example of this and, and to kind of, uh, you know, like give a roadmap because I know X marks a spot, right? But I just don't know how to get there, really. Um, but I can give you some sort of examples, right? Um, let's say, you know, we came up with a pill today or a scientist came up with a pill today, right? Uh, and that pill can cure cancer, Let's just, let's just say that, you know, this pill can cure cancer and this pill can double your life expectancy. You know, humans who use this can live until the age of 150. Now, that would be great, right? But the problem is this pill is not cheap. You know, this pill is still experimental. We haven't scaled up the production of this pill yet. It's not like mass market, you know, uh, it's not being mass manufactured, so it's very expensive. And also, imagine this pill needs to be taken while you're still in the womb, while you're still very, very young. Now, that puts all of us outside of the benefit zone. But we have to pay for this pill. We have to build the factories with our money, right, and our time and our effort and our energy. The taxpayer dollars that are going to come into producing these pills are going to be out of our pockets, and the benefit is all going to be for our children, right? So what about the people who don't have children, right? What about the people whose children live in other countries? What about the people who live in other countries? Their parents live in other countries, but they live here, right? So you you get into all these problems. So even though something can easily, anybody, you ask them on the street, they'll tell you this is a good thing, right? There's always details and the devil is always in the details yeah. who's going to pay for it right so can, can i intervene there so one camp suggests that technology does cause change so the agent of change is a technological innovation 
the invention of ChatGPT or some sort of AI. Another side argues that the technology doesn't drive the change. Um, that's what's labeled technological determinism, and it's the social practices that adopt the technology that drives the change. So this original question about economics makes me think immediately of the past um, technological transformations and their effects on the economy. And one of the undoubted effects, I'm a, a communication scholar, so I study the history of communication technologies. And if we think about AI as a kind of communication technology, you can look back to digital media, to mass media at, as instances of technological change. Then the question is, did those new technologies drive change or was it the social practices by which they were adopted that drove the change? And the, one of the obvious changes is inequality. So, you know, I think, Robert, what you were describing is as short-term pain has me much more worried because the short-term pain is going to be an acceleration of already existing economic inequalities, especially in that example you just used about the cancer pill. Like, some people are going to have access, other people won't. And if underpinning this new technological invention are a set of social practices that are already oriented around economic inequality, then in what ways will a technological change accelerate existing kinds of economic inequality? So I, I mean, I'm gone from the original question, just trying to find this this silver lining, which yeah. I can also talk about some about in a, in a bit. But that has has me worried, and I don't know if it's as simple as technology A disrupts. Well, sort of, yes and, and no. It's also the way the social practices use it and adopt it and, and integrate it into our world. Yeah. I mean, in a way, we can think about the technological disruption as having several different paths and potentials within it. And then the social application of a new technology and the commercial application of a new technology is what sort of determines what among those many potential paths forward becomes the one that gets taken. I think that's and right. Which yeah. ones become the possibilities that fall away. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm suggesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, if we can, if we can talk about, you know, if we can talk about the philosophical doctrinaires <laughs> involved, which are always fun to talk about because in some ways I've worked in philosophy departments before that's my PhD and background. So I have seen, you know, the conversation quickly fall into determinism versus indeterminism camps and who's right and who's wrong. Whereas I think where we're going is something like both of those sides are correct. There are new potentials and new possibilities that wouldn't have happened without the development of the technology. But now it becomes a question of, again, which ones of those are activated and which choices drive uh, where the technology eventually goes and what it's used for and what gets left behind and what gets moved forward. Which brings me to sort of the next uh, point I guess I wanted to focus on, which is, you know, in the short term, in the long term, we can see start to see the benefits forming of the ways in which AI simplifies a lot of human impacts, but also allows the impact of a human to grow. But now also there's the matter of what is that short-term pain going to look like? What are what, for instance, are a couple of the industries that are going to be most impacted right now and in the near future by AI? And where will the role of humans change? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, to begin, you know, I always like to do so with an example, right, or with a story. Um, I have this buddy who uh, he's also friends with the CTO of our company, Dave. Um, so uh, you guys might not know this, but Dave has done uh, quite a few odd jobs here and there. He used to be a construction worker, briefly, uh, one summer. And uh, he, he told me he met this guy once, um, you know, driving trucks and everything, right? Uh, that guy was, you know, his uh, co-pilot on the truck. The guy would bring things there, and then his co-pilot, this, you know, big burly Greek dude, uh, 19 years old or whatever, would uh, be the guy who unloads it, right? And he told me, this guy made $5 more than me, and yet he had to do all this backbreaking work. And, you know, he's probably going to have horrible back problems when he, uh, you know, gets gets older. Not not much older, you know. They're, they're going to set in when he's 40 or 45. That's a lot of pain. And um, 
you know, by the time his kids grow up or whatever, it's going to be tough for him to go on vacations with them, right? It's going to be tough for him to uh, enjoy his retirement. Uh, you know, he's going to have health complications until the day he dies. All this can be automated, you know? Uh, and the people who can't be automated, the engineers, for example, the architects, the planners, those people, well, they don't have to put their body necessarily through that much strain in the first place, right? But bringing it back to the original question, what are these people going to do after their job gets automated away? You know, some people may argue that having a bad job is better than having no job at all. And and that's true, right? Uh, I think we sit here with a very rosy definition of the past because we look back 200 years ago, 300 years ago, and we don't see any of the short-term, day-to-day, devil-in-the-detail things, right? We just see the broad strokes of history that were more or less written by historians and not commoners, right? The people whose job was taken away and never came back and everything, those are not included in the history books. What's included in the history books is hindsight, right? Looking back, we know that this all worked out. At the time, it was not clear that it would work out, you know? So, um, you know, I, I, I do have to say that I'm optimistic in the long term, but you can be optimistic in the long term while pessimistic in the short term. Uh, this is a paradox that crops up everywhere, you know, uh, in the stock market, you know, in, in the short term, the stock market always goes down. In the long term, the stock market always goes up, right? Um, and this, this is something that happens so often that it's almost like a natural law. It's everywhere I look, right? But this is, a, again, another one of those examples. Uh, you know, the outlook is stormy in the short term and rosy and sunny in the long term. That's, that's really what it is. Yeah. I mean, some of those labor impacts, what are some other examples you guys can think of to, to make this more specific? Because we're seeing labor impacts right now in certain parts of the creative industries. Mm -hmm. Um, Things like closed caption writing or descriptive audio writing are already beginning to see the impacts. The uh, Writers Guild strike that's ongoing, a big feature of what they're negotiating for is, you know, for writers to have greater say in how generative AI is applied to what they do. And, you know, there's kind of two directions I'd like to probe in this. Uh, One has to do with the product quality itself, because one of the things that, you know, is the easiest thing to joke about AI on the Internet is when AI produces very poor quality substitutes for real images. There is a for instance, there's a mayoral candidate as we speak. Uh, running for mayor of Toronto, who recently released some ads. And I can kind of see you smiling, Robert. You might have seen this already, uh, where they released the ads. And these are ads that were actually reviewed and approved by multiple campaign staff and the candidate, where it's very clear that AI has produced the images. Because in some of these images, there are people with three arms, with their arms simultaneously folded and then another, they have another hand coming out and sort of holding their hand to the side, but wearing a different shirt. And the arm emerges from her chest from pretty much the same spot as her left arm. And other strange images like this and other kinds of things like unnatural and weird seeming dialogue that are written by AI software. And the thing I'd like to probe with some of the folks developing this in the room is to what degree are these the growing pains of the technology? And to what degree might these be signs that this might not be the best place to apply this right now, or maybe even ever? Yeah, I mean, I think that's the best question. So I don't think the disruption will come from the automation of blue collar jobs. I think that's something historically we've seen, uh, we kind of know what happens. I think the disruption comes from lawyers and journalists and so the the kind of most terrible example that i know of is the possibility of a political consultant an ai political consultant who targets messaging to individual citizens with the intention of changing their voting behavior right like so that thing if it screws up as badly as you just described it won't like the candidate will fail but if the 
the Liberal Party and the Conservative Party each have their own warring AI um, bot that directs messages to individual citizens, that thing, that technology is going to determine the outcome of the election. And it's also going to replace like some high paid communication consultants, people that do what I do, yeah. that are, are going to be out of a job. Um, and presumably, like, I don't know if this is true, but presumably the technology will actually be better at human communication consultants because of their ability to tailor messaging directly to an individual based on all the information they have about the individual. So a hundred years ago when we had um, mass media campaigns, uh, you know, you needed a certain communication consultant to write like ads in a newspaper. And then we had Nixon and, and JFK on TV and you had needed a different kind of communication consultant. Those were all humans trying to manage in that environment. And now you're going to have a kind of an AI technology that will, will be so direct and have all this information about a human being that they're trying to change the behavior of. That, I think, is where the big disruptions lie. I know some lawyers have tried to replace some of their, you know, junior lawyers with the AI and they're having, you know, medium success. They don't need 20 lawyers anymore. They need two and somebody to run the, the prompt chat GPT or with the right or the right sentences or the right questions or, or whatever. But I don't have an answer for you. I have no idea. I think that's the where the most disruptive potential lies and the most uncertainty, at least from my perspective, lies. Those existing technology companies, Google, Facebook, they have at their disposal an enormous amount of information about the electorate of Canada or the U.S. or, or wherever. And that information is necessary for the AI to do the work of leveraging a, a kind of strategy tailored to that particular group. We saw like a tiny sliver of this in the first, the Clinton-Trump uh, election, where Trump used a kind of like analytic process of tailoring Facebook ads to specific personality types from from information but what what this is like that on speed it's just so much faster uh so much more specific and so much more detailed and the, the thing you were saying about power is really important because it gets back to my original point about inequality like it seems to me that a very small number of companies will ultimately control these kinds of ai tools and um, that would seem to accelerate existing inequalities, not alleviate them. Yeah. You know, like Facebook and digital media revolution was an absolute, complete, total failure in doing the work of connecting the world. It, it, Facebook thinks it's connecting other people, but they're not. They're, they're, it's created polarization, factionalization, misinformation. Yeah, echo chain. like it's done all of this other work. So now those companies that have all that enormous inf power and information, what are they going to leverage these <laughs> that information for is like a really important question. Yeah, I mean, it's one way in which we can look at the recent shift in Silicon Valley history is by seeing how the increasingly powerful companies have been those who are best at controlling, surveilling, and, and making sense of information. I mean... You know, one of the one of the obvious examples that to me doesn't get quite enough press as it really should is is Palantir, which is one of a f company that is really, you know, we don't hear about a lot of this stuff because they're very good at not mentioning a lot of the stuff that they do. But they are one of the companies that are on the forefront of AI development and the different more silent or less visible ways that AI intervenes and and the way analytics and machine learning intervene in human society and the development of human society and that you know is something a general theme that i think i'll you know we should pursue in this whole podcast series is thinking about how the hidden elements of that technology can do its work without necessarily being seen in the flashier sense right i always think about the the story of the 2000 dot-com crash uh, versus some of the reality of what really happened.
because the story was so many people developed all these internet businesses and for whatever different kinds of logistical reasons that you can analyze, a lot of them ended up going bust. But then you think, well, quite a lot of the major billionaires who have a long life in Silicon Valley, right? They came up in the 1990s tech boom and they walked away from the collapse of their companies with, in some cases, billion dollar fortunes. Jeff Berwick is one of those folks coming to my mind as just one example, right? And the reason why all of is that all of the technological products that were developed to run those businesses that did not do well ended up being the foundation of the business models that became our major cartel of Silicon Valley tech companies today. And they now operate on an engine of cultivating small businesses cultivating entrepreneurs so that they can buy out the best of their technological products down the line. And I mean, that really is, you know, getting into the purpose of what AI is going to be doing here and all of its labor applications. Uh, you know, one thing I want to ask the rest of the panel before we take a break, and I think Rob Danish uh, you might be the best suited to talk about this, given your expertise, is where are those changes in the economy going to go? What seems to be the imperative of the most powerful folks in the industry right now in terms of how AI and machine learning and the similar analytic systems are going to be applied? What are going to be the growth industries for that technology? Well, so I, I want to start where you started before, though. I, I think yeah. It was really interesting what you just said, because in my field, a media or medium singular is a thing in between. It's in, in the middle. It's between you and I. So any media, if it's a TV screen, if it's um, a TikTok, if it's Instagram, is between us. And I think AI is another thing, another medium in that it will mediate between you and I or between me and some other, other people. Now, um, in media theory, the, the theorists that I, I work with will tell you that media is also part infrastructure. And when it's working really well, it's the infrastructure we don't notice. It's kind of like the invisible stuff that's between us. And as infrastructure, it kind of like organizes our life. It kind of like structures our way of being in the world. So I think what's going to happen undoubtedly is that AI will help structure our way of being in the world. It will exist between us, all of us, as a kind of structuring component that may be a bit invisible. It may kind of like operate behind the scenes so that you don't really notice it and you don't know, notice how it's doing that structuring work. Odds are those media companies are going to choose the most profitable way of like structuring us with one another. And so um, I think it's a pretty likely scenario where like i don't know what those profit centers will be but they'll seek out let me give you this amazon is a medium the reason that jeff bezos is a billionaire is because he invented a super cool medium like it's a giant store through which we interact that's never existed before um, but he's not selling anything any unique product or, or whatever he's he's got the space in between us so how they choose to kind of monetize um, AI as a medium, as a kind of middle point between you and I, um, will be interesting to see. Social media kind of like relied on advertising. That's what you were talking about. Like how Facebook got so powerful is because, and why they're so American, is because they're advertising companies and they're leveraging the history of American advertising. I actually think that might not be the same for AI. I'm not sure it's going to be an advertising tool as a medium between you and you and I, but I'm not sure like what it means for monetization of a medium. Like I, I think that's to be determined. I guess I, I don't know. Yeah. I'm going to ask Robert. Speaking back to that point again, uh, Robert Danish. That is uh, speaking back to that point again. It's one of the things we're thinking about when it comes to how AI is going to affect our world is that this is a technology that has commercial imperatives behind it, but that has a lot of very prof potentially profound and, and transformative effects 
on the way that we communicate with each other because it so radically changes a lot of the media through which we communicate with each other. So what could be some directions or, or ways in which how we communicate with each other changes when we introduce those commercial imperatives, right? When, yeah. yeah. So I think inside communication, we have a concept called authenticity. And authenticity is this like hugely valuable thing in communication. So even if, if we love our partner and they love us, we want an authentic expression of that love. And if we do it inauthentically, they're kind of suspicious and it, it degrades the relationship and it creates sort of, sort of challenges and problems. Uh, so the question on my mind seems to be whether uh, AI could communicate in authentic ways, uh, in ways that we would, would that at least would produce the kind of feeling of authenticity in, in audiences. I don't, I haven't seen that yet. Like I'm a skeptic about whether that's possible. I think that's because um, in terms of content generation, so if a journalist is writing a, a news article or if a poem, poet is writing a new poem or a, a musical artist is writing a new song, that's a kind of inventional process of sort of reading uh, cultural moments and coming up with a new set of associations that would authentically articulate something about that cultural moment. So I think there are significant limitations to AI's ability to generate content in, in that way. And I think it might be due to some of the technical structure of it as a kind of medium. Yeah. Um, now, I think that also means, though, that companies aren't going to stop it from generating content, right? Like, And people will still use it to help them generate content. So my own teenage sons... When they're asked to write an essay in, in high school, they'll go on ChatGPT and prompt it for, and it'll kick them off in, in starting. So the best way to imagine it is as a kind of resource tool for doing communicative work, to, to kind of giving us starting points or touchstones or yeah. like opening up possibilities. Overcoming but, the blank page anxiety. Yes, like yeah. I think it could be really, really good at that. But in terms of like finished products and like finely wrought sentences or paragraphs. I'm not seeing that quite, quite yet. Um, and I don't think it will disrupt our kind of need for authenticity, our need for authentic connection sort of between friends or lovers or acquaintances or, or whatever. And I'm skeptical that it, it will even be able to mimic that stuff well enough to, kind of lead to some dystopian, horrible outcome. Like, I, I'm just not sure if that's the case yet. Um, so, yeah. I mean, you know, one of the things that I think is interesting in terms of the differences between how artificial intelligence works and how human or animal intelligence works is this question that I think demonstrates where those limitations come from, which is that... Humans and animals in most forms of evolved life perceive in a bodily first way. And artificial intelligence is working much more from an information first way, right? When you look at how machine learning functions, right? You train the data, you train the machine on this enormous data set and you program it with different algorithms to hunt for a variety of different correlations and and which correlations seem to have the the most effect in changing other correlations and other kinds of uh reflective or or meta referential um associations and patterns and tendencies right but then there's a certain point where the machine learning not only does the machine learning stop in some cases and that's not even really a firm boundary you could conceivably as algorithms advance you know, have the interactions constantly retrain the system. I've seen that discussed a lot of times before, too. Um, but the difference seems to be a an animal or human intelligence that learns by sort of experimental engagement with the world and a machine intelligence that is learning through finding and testing correlations in the data that it encounters. And 
it's a very good intelligence. It's a very good system at mapping and figuring out those correlations. And it figures out correlations in much bigger data sets than the human brain or perception can possibly handle. But then when it attempts to do what humans use perception to do using those correlation hunting methods, that's where we begin to see a lot of the weaknesses of artificial intelligence come from. So Robert, one, I'm wondering, you know, what some of the technical limitations are in that mode of thinking and, and do I have that description really right as well as something that I'm curious about? Cause I'm, I'm a humanities head. You're much more the engineer in this conversation. So do I have that technological difference right? And, and what could be some of those limitations or, or advantages as well? So one advantage right off the bat that, you know, um, human or biological substrate AI has or intelligence has over a machine intelligence is retrainability, you know? It's way, way easier for me and you to retrain in the... Um, in the uh, what's called AI sense, right? Uh, and that's what makes us so much more flexible than a lot of AIs, you know? Um, the whole human brain is able to, over time, rewire itself to be something completely unrecognizable to what it used to be. And um, the human brain actually takes advantage of natural damage or decay to rewire itself, right? AI is unable to sufficiently do that, you know. When its computing substrate is damaged, the whole system will go down. So it's not a very strong or uh, it, it's quite a fragile computing substrate, even though it has a lot more power than we do. Um, and most importantly, in order to retrain AI, you need a huge amount of information. And you also need to figure out a way in order to refresh the whole data set, you know. You could use the old data set or whatever, but you'll get roughly similar results, right? Um, now, they have been trying to get around this, for example. There's been uh, situations in which all they do is, you know, imagine you have like 20, 30 layers of, uh, of neurons, right? You only train the last one or two layers. That will give you different ideas, right, or different results. This is also what humans do, right? Um, it's only our last few neurons that are really doing most of the retraining. Um, but... You know, in order to retrain the whole network or retrain earlier neurons in the network, it takes a lot more energy and a lot more firepower to do that for an AI than a human being, mostly because those are so deep in there that it's untouchable, you know. Um, to give you an example, you know, a project that I did a long time ago was image detection, right? Um, I took an off-the-shelf uh, model called You Only Look Once or YOLO, right? It was a V4 model. It's quite good, actually, at the time. I um, love the names in the whole <laughs> industry. It's just one of the funniest things. Anyway, sorry. Yeah, yeah. And I took a simplified version of that. Yeah, it's called YOLO. Uh, you can look it up. That's but I took a simplified version of that that was able to be run on laptops. And all I did was I just trained the last two or three layers. So the use case was, okay, you know, somebody's playing video games, right? Um, when they get a new high score, and the AI is going to be watching for that, and then it's going to just save that moment. You know, it's going to clip that moment out. All you needed was a last layer of training, right? But in order to do much more complicated things, you need memory, right? And that is the difficulty. That's where most of the upper layers are doing, you know? If you actually look into the details of what upper layer image recognition neurons are doing, they're doing things like, um, what is the edge? Like, like, they're asking questions like this. What is the difference between a circle and a square? You know, what is the difference between the edge of an object and the middle of an object, right? And you have neurons that detect edges, they, and then the next layer you have neurons that piece edges together to detect corners, right? And then only at the very end do you have a cohesive, cohesive answer, like, ah, that's a lizard, right? Mm -hmm. So um, that's really a difficulty in AI versus human intelligence, but they're getting there very quickly because, you know, um, every, you know fundamentally what a artificial intelligence neural network is it's a model of the brain right and as we learn more about the brain we can build better and better models of the brain yeah. right what we're finding out now is that these neural networks which were built you know 20 30 years ago by by the greats of uh, of the time 
actually have nothing to do with what the brain actually looks like. They barely scratch the surface of what the actual brain does, right? Yeah. The brain is far more complicated because it's not based on statistics at all, yeah. you know. Um, it's based off of uh, what's it called? Um, many different type of models of um, uh, data transmission. On one hand, you have direct transmission. You know, a neuron sends you a bolt of electricity, you pass it down. Yeah. It's like, you know, broken telephone in a way. But what the brain also does is that it knows neurons are failable. Sometimes a neuron makes a mistake and doesn't send the signal downwards. But in an artificial, in, in, a, in a, what's it called, a um, neural network, if that happens, the thing will break, right? The brain, actually, the human brain, uses that on purpose. It has built that into the system to create statistical randomness yeah you know human brains are also affected by high level things like neurotransmitters right when neurotransmitters are released in a certain area it stimulates that area and it increases the efficiency or decreases the efficiency in a localized area ais do not have anything comparable to that you know there's no way to stimulate an entire group of neurons there's not even enough neurons to stimulate really in in most cases and also brains have even more high level things like hormones Yes. You know, hormonal changes can impact the whole brain in ways that every neuron will do differently, right? A certain hormone will affect two neurons differently, but it will affect them. There's no way to do that with a neural network. Yeah. But the thing is, we now know, are starting to understand more and more about how these things work, right? So we're starting to realize that we shouldn't have built this network like this to be so fragile. We should have, you know, maybe not try to remove this as a bug, but accommodated yeah. it as a feature, right? Yeah. And so now we have these things called dropout layers mm. in which every single cycle, certain neurons will randomly choose not to do anything. Mm. You know, that, like, you know, sometimes you're training a, a neural network and it overfits, right? It, it starts to memorize things. It, it's not telling you what's a cat or a dog anymore. It's just memorizing, oh, you know, cats are black and dogs are brown. So you, you give it a black square and it says cat, right? Yeah. Now we add these things like dropout layers or dropout neurons or whatever. And the neural network doesn't have a chance to ossify in that sense, uh, right? Yes. So we're starting to build better and better, better neural networks because now we have a better and better understanding of the brain, right? Yeah. There'll be a day in which, you know, I don't think there'll ever be a day in which a neural network is better at the brain pound for pound. But we're getting to the point in which we're starting to realize that it's a trade-off. The brain is no longer the gold standard, right? It's like, it's no longer, this is the best thing, and we just need to copy it. Yeah. We're starting to get to a point in which it's like, okay, we're basically starting to get 80% of the way there, you know? Maybe we're 50% of the way there, but we're starting to see the point in which we're getting to a point where becoming the brain is not actually beneficial. We're starting to get to a point in which it's like, okay, if we go down this route, we'll build a human brain. But if we go down this route, now this is interesting. We're going to build a whole new type of brain, but it's not going to be worse or better. It's going to be different, right? Yeah. And that's that's really this fourth industrial revolution point that we're getting to. You know, we're getting to the point in which we're we're able to build an ecosystem of brains, right? Yeah. There has never been a brain other than the biological brain on Earth before, right? That is really interesting. Yeah, but that doesn't mean there's no other brain like the biological brain and the biological brain is the most superior type of brain, right? You know, com computational brains, statistical brains, right? DNA brains or whatever. These can all work and they do have trade-offs. Thing is, we don't even know what the pros and the cons are. But isn't one component of intelligence, whether it's a human brain or one of these other kinds of brains you're describing, one component the capacity for self-reflection or reflectivity, reflexivity, whereby, like I think one thing good humans are good at is thinking about the consequences of their actions and then revising their habits in the light of those consequences. So if I eat a bunch of things that are really, really terrible for me and then I get sick, I think to myself, well, I'm not going to eat those things anymore and so I can reflect on what's happened and revise. What I don't see out of AI right now is that habit for reflexivity. Would these alternatives that are in development have a, comp a reflexive component or, or no? Because, by the way, I also think that reflexivity 
is part of having an ethics, a, a part of human ethics, period. Yeah. Part of our ability to determine good and bad and, and right and wrong includes that kind of reflection on the consequences of our actions. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think, you know, um, the human brain is much more sophisticated than AIs are um, by far at, at this point in terms of reflexivity because of the retraining problem, right? It's much easier to retrain a human brain than an AI brain. And also, you know, um, we haven't had the need to produce AIs that are that complicated yet, right? Uh, what a human brain is, and the difference between a human brain, which is an artificial general intelligence, versus a AI brain, which is a specific intelligence, is that a human brain is a net of nets, right? It is a combination of many different neural networks combined together in one system. And the neural networks can work together they can adversarially work together or cooperatively work together. And there's also a bigger upper executive neural network that kind of runs the whole show, you know. We don't really have that in AI right now. And because we don't have that, there's nobody really telling any of these individual neural networks that we've come up with how to improve, you know. They just work together um, because they've been wired up it, but but it's almost like a MacGyver type of contraption. It's not really a system that works together. Uh, however, we are starting to come up with these newer systems, um, and and these systems are roughly what have created the image recognition and the image generation explosion, right? Called adversarial neural networks or generative adversarial neural networks. What these do is they take two nets and they put them in a competition against each other, right? And you see, we're already starting to produce. Um, results out of this that are similar to higher order intelligences, right? Once you have two neural networks working against each other, you can scale that up to 5, 10, 20, 30. It's, it's all a matter of, you know, like we figured it out the first time. It's just a matter of scaling it, right? At that point, then you do have the capacity to create uh, reflection because eventually um, these neural networks together, there's something... It's almost like an emergent phenomenon, you know? Like, I can't really point at one neural network and say it. It starts here, you know? Um, it kind of starts everywhere yeah. at once, right? Yeah. That's, that's, that's really hard to... Adam, I think that down. your original question yeah. is, if, if and when that's possible, yeah. it, to me it's more disruptive of our communication habits and practices. Um, the, the singular neural network that you're talking about, just the specific artificial intelligence, seems to me that it would just be... Um, another feature of our already existing communication habitat and wouldn't really disrupt that. But yeah. this other thing would be much more disruptive from my perspective because I'm not sure I, I, like I, I can't even trace out all the implications of communicating with such a thing um, that also has the same reflexivity that I have or at least a kind of reflexivity where it could potentially anticipate its consequences it's the act the my reaction to it and then take that into account in its communication with me you know that's a, another level i think of disruption yeah yeah it's it's interesting you know because when when we talk about the the technological developments and the creativity behind it, coming up with different ways to let these neural networks sort of interact and play off each other to figure out what new kinds of reasoning can result from that. It, it sounds to me like what we're trying to do in the AI industry, in the machine learning industry, is figure out how those We'll check that. Is what we're trying to do in in the AI industry is figure out how to catch up with you know what I described in our recording break as you know four billion years yeah. of bacterial and and living evolution as all of these different cellular processes have developed and and figured each other out you know in in I mean imagine. Four billion years worth of evolution when a single generation might be 15, 20 minutes and get natural selection to work from the very basic levels of like 
the minim most minimal possible cell. Here is a membrane that surrounds a metabolic chemical reaction and the membrane and the reaction can move so that it can consume other things. Run that process for four billion years and then add a few more hundred million years once you get all of those processes able to connect together into multicellular organisms, yeah. right? And what you have is a nearly four billion years of fine tuning the very, very foundational systems and developing new complexities within all those systems. And then once they're fine tuned and complex enough to be able to fit together into multicellular systems, then you start to see all the proliferation of macro scale life that's only happened over the last 400 or so million years, right? And now try to imagine in the most ambitious artificial intelligence research lab, you are trying to replicate that path and that complexity and all of the potentials that came out of that evolution in the space of either A, a generation or two of human life, or B, uh, the even greater impatience of next year's annual income report on yeah, this investment It's, it's doing that yeah. inside a capitalist system, too. Yeah. Y you know, you're, what you're describing is amazing, but it's being pressured by a, a system of profit and loss yeah. and... Yes like money and power and politics. And so that other 4 million or however many million year thing yeah. didn't have those same social pressures no. shaping it in the same sort of ways. And that's probably why it took so long, right? I mean, yeah. Yeah. But uh, that that's also probably why, you know, um, what came out was completely unique, you know? Um, so I don't think it's possible really for us to uh, give an AI this much time. I don't think it would be even smart as well because what would come out of it would be completely alien, you know, completely unrecognizable. Yeah. Um, I think the way that I see AI right now, and I, I, I integrate it into, you know, the, 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 the history of Earth, I guess, or history of life, is that it's kind of like a new step, really, in, in evolution, in a sense. Um, and AI doesn't have to be its own thing, right? Uh, when we come up with these new nets, right, and we come up with these new tools like image generation or image recognition or, or you know, um, like uh, text generation, text-to-speech, these things, they're all little gizmos, right? But, you know, we're faced with a problem that we don't have something to tie together. The thing is, it's right in front of you. It's in my head. I have something to tie it all together, and it's called my brain, you know? And so um, one easy workaround that I think people will be using more and more and more as as uh, you know, in the next decade, uh, as this becomes a decade-defining trend, is that is is integration with our existing workflows and our you know our minds and everything, right? Like um, lawyers and doctors will probably start to integrate, you know, like a, for example, a X-ray doctor will start to increasingly integrate image recognition um, AIs to detect tumors, right? Or lawyers will start to increasingly integrate uh, scraping AI to scrape through thousands and millions of cases to figure out. You know, has this been done before? Is there a precedent? Where's the precedent? What did the precedent look like and everything? And at the end of the day, um, you know, it'll be a co-evolution, right? Because these AIs will be getting better very quickly, you know, at an increasingly quicker pace. But at the same time, we will be getting better at an increasingly quicker pace using and leveraging these AI tools, right? So um, I think people look at an AI in isolation and they look at how fast it's growing uh, and it's not growing extremely fast right now anyways, but they look at how quickly these, these um, innovations have come out and think that, you know, we're doomed, right? Uh, I, I think in a sense, you know, blue collar jobs and certain white collar jobs like copywriting and, and uh, you know, call center receptionists and telemarketers and these things will have a very tough time. Like accountants are even even having a tough time right now. A lot of them are transitioning towards like higher level accounting, like accountant, like, you know, financial consulting now is a lot of things that they're doing. But, you know, uh, these people are going to have a tough time. But uh, as always, you know, that has happened in history, as always, the... Um, the ecosystem, the economy always finds a way to continue trugging on 
and integrate these new technologies in a way that is productive to itself, right? I'm reminded of the um, third industrial revolution uh, where specifically they invented a lot of like, you know, uh, or, or no, fourth, uh, second or third industrial revolution where they invented tractor technology, right? And this was a revolution in, in agriculture. Now, this didn't impact all farmers the same. Um, you know, back then, something like 50% of the population were farming. Today, it's about 2 or 3%, right? Where did all those people go, you know? Out of maybe 10 farmers or 20 farmers, the richest one or the richest two of them had the money and the capital to purchase these tractors and these tools. Inequality skyrocketed for a short period of time. These other nine farmers who went bankrupt and they couldn't compete, they moved to the cities, right? They moved um, in search of jobs in the factories and stuff like that. And today, we live in a objectively better world, a world in which most people don't have to do backbreaking work in the fields to survive. But it was very painful getting there, right? I think a lot of people, they see the extremes. One extreme is AI is not useful at all. It will have a you know, surface level impact. It's just some cool gizmo. On the other hand, people see the other extreme, which is that you know, an AI is going to take over the world, right? It's going to replace us. It's going to be the next overlord or whatever. I mean, you know, tractors didn't necessarily replace farmers, right? Farmers upskilled themselves in order to be able to utilize these new technologies. Some succeeded, some didn't. I would say most of them didn't, unfortunately. But, you know, at the end of the day, we still have something that we call a farmer, even though it would be completely unrecognizable uh, to somebody 100 years ago, that does the same thing, right? I think in 100 years, if you ask somebody in the 25th century or something to, you know, uh, you ask them, like, do you guys still have um, communications analysts? They'll be like, for sure, yeah. But if he shows you a guy who's a communications analyst, you would have, you would have no idea what he's doing, you know. He, he wouldn't be able to explain to you what he's doing either because, you know, it would, it would have changed so much, right? Like, it, it would kind of be like a modern-day guy with a, with a John Deere tractor going back... 200 years trying to explain to some to some guy farming in the prairies like this is how you start the machine this is how you run the combine they don't even know where to begin you know it's yeah. like what's so the, a combine you know <laughs> this opens the possibility for me to say something optimistic yeah. which i know we kind of started and I, I think what you're describing to me so I, i'm a professor so i'm in I, you know i teach courses at the university and one thing that i'm increasingly preoccupied by is the the we don't have a need anymore for what I would call encyclopedic knowledge. Like knowing facts is kind of irrelevant. Why would anybody teach a, a student facts anymore? Um, because we could just Google it. Or and, and so there's some sense in which, you know, what I would call knowing that information, which was left up to humans and humans like as possessors of information were really valuable and that was a sign of intelligence, et cetera, is no longer applicable. But to me, that's really exciting because that means that education is more about skills like synthesis and invention. Yeah. And you use the word integration, right? Like how do you link these things together? How do you um, integrate them all into, a, you said the workflow, I think. I, I wouldn't maybe use that word. But like how do you integrate them into a kind of business plan or a kind of new innovative kind of way forward in some area. And essentially what you're describing in farming is like a way to integrate these new technologies into farming practice. So I think a sign of an educated person would be more not the knowing that information encyclopedic stuff, but it's the knowing how to do the work of synthesis and integration and innovation and invention. Um, I don't think our institutions of higher education have pivoted to that yet. Like we're still yeah. giving kids multiple choice tests where we determine whether or not they've acquired the right information. But eventually, like, I think we will get to that space. And that creates a kind of different form of human freedom to be disburdened from having to possess encyclopedic knowledge and instead be given the freedom to kind of work on these critical forms of synthesis so that you can leverage the AI tools or the information provided by AI tools to do other kinds of other kinds of work. To me, that's kind of exciting. Um, the scary part is still the kind of metacognitive AI that could be, I think, more disruptive, mm. where the integration and synthesis is being doing being done by the AI itself. <laughs> like I think that's another level of of scariness to me. But yeah, yeah the first thing is exciting. 
Yeah, and I think the last thing that um, I want to really talk about in our uh, in this session right now is you know probing some of that element of synthesis because one of the things that is really important, and this kind of gets back to that question that I introduced when we first came back of monetization, you know, and the the fact that these technologies are all being developed with business motives and profit motives behind them. And that, you know, the, the example of, you know, we can just Google that information. One of the most interesting things that we've seen in the evolution of Google as a company is the fact that they first took their imperative in the early parts of Google search to be, yes, this is where you will find out the facts. But now we can see how the structure of the search engine reveals certain facts to us rather than others, or in response to a certain kind of inquiry might lead us down one path rather than another. And a big part of human intelligence are those critical faculties of figuring out where am I being taken by this inquiry? What facts are being revealed to me? And what falsehoods are being revealed to me when I phrase an inquiry in a certain way and I'm led down a path that has, you know, a lot of omissions and a lot of, shall we say, problematically self-interested omissions. And while we don't have time to get into the full political implications of this, that will certainly be on another episode of the New Intelligence Podcast. But that question of who controls and in what interests are the results of our inquiries and the results of our search for facts and the use of these new tools being used for and I just want to, you know, Robert, I would like to, if I w could close this session with some of your thoughts on how those different, how do we navigate those different imperatives in our thinking? And how do we navigate those different imperatives as we engage with the different media forms we, uh, you know, that mediate our world for us? Yeah, that's a really small question, question, I know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you're, you're coming back to that idea that media kind of structure our lives for us. And, you know, algorithms aren't neutral. So the, the Google algorithm, even, you know, Twitter, like, so Twitter, you know, the people that tweet the most get the most, like, it, it benefits the just volume. Yes. <laughs> and uh, Instagram and Facebook, uh, th their, their algorithms are determined by attention, right? So things that get attention get more attention and get promoted, right? Like, this is not good for democracy. Uh, it's really, really bad for collective decision making. It just basically we know this about Facebook. Now it means misinformation and disinformation circulate further and faster because they're based on communication practices of hyperbole and exaggeration. And <laughs> like, like they're not. In, it's not interesting to learn the kind of scientific details of a vaccine. It's interesting to hear some outlandish, ridiculous story about it, and then that gets promoted and circulated faster, and it's disruptive of public decision making essentially. Uh, so to me, when, uh, when I hear your question, I hear the, the necessity of, of regulation, of government intervention by humans regulating AI systems so that they're not in positions of promoting and circulating dis or misinformation and corrupting or polluting the kind of public culture, public decision making. It's sort of like, think of it like this, like eating, think of it like eating an information diet. Like there's no question to me that AI could be really helpful with producing really high quality components of our diet and circulating them really broadly. But it could also be used to just produce junk and a lot of junk and circulating junk really, really quickly. So if we're all just consuming junk, we're going to get sick. And if we're consuming really healthy kind of bits of information, we can leverage that for really good decision making. It can help democratic processes. But to me, that's a problem of regulation. So Facebook or no major media company, if left unregulated, will just choose the healthy foods. They're going to choose whatever is most profitable. And I don't know that we know what that is for AI. We know what it is for digital media and social media. And it's attention grabbing um, <laughs> kind of the, the most prolific voices that get circulated over and over again. We know we have answers to those questions. Yeah. Um, 
so I think we need regulation to make sure the answers to the AI questions don't look exactly the same as the answers to the digital media questions or the social media questions. Yeah. And, and we don't get regulation in the interests of ordinary folks without a lot of self-conscious yep. organizing by those ordinary folks, which is also disrupted and creates, we are also familiar with the problems of, you know, organizing people that have happened, yep. you know, because of that structure of the attention economy in that, yep. in that digital medium universe. Yeah. I mean, I think implied in what you just said is the question, can AI help save us from social media? Uh, can it circulate information? It can be a valuable communication tool in counteracting some of the damage that social media has done to the public sphere. Um, I have no idea. Like uh, some yeah. days I think yes, some days I think definitely not. Yeah. Uh, I think that will really um, deter, <laughs> like it will be a really important question in the next 40 or 50 years, how that sort of plays out. Yeah. And I don't think it can play out without political, social intervention by ethically oriented and responsible humans. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And that, I think, is a great way to end our session for today, the first episode of the New Intelligence Podcast. Once again, may we look back on this one day at embarrassment, at the low-budget uh, way we have managed to assemble it today. Um, and I'm looking forward to the next one, where we can uh, continue to probe some more of these concepts and ideas, because let me tell you, we are not done. We are far from done. Um, so thank you, Robert Wan. Uh, thank you, Robert Danish. Thank you, Midgerson Maya, who is out of the session room right now. But uh, thank you anyway. And thank me, Adam Reggio, the host and content manager for 25th Century Magazine. And we will see you all. Hopefully, we'll see you in the future. I hope we do. Anyway, thank you so much for that. We will see you soon. 